Let's just bow our heads for prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Ah! Father, we want to thank you for this chance to be here today. We pray that you will be with this class and bless as we uh, do another year, and that you will uh, give us all direction. Be with Laura today, we pray in your name. Amen. And Laura, everybody knows Laura. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I noticed that my slides take a bit because there are so many photos that it, it takes a little bit. And of course, this one just turned immediately, so maybe not. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the art on this campus. I'm focused today on the statues, the sculptures. And they have a lot to say to us, I think, not only artistically, but also what they mean and what they mean to Loma Linda. And so I think that our art reflects our mission. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. You may have walked by this and seen this. Uh, it wasn't, actually, this is the second Good Samaritan sculpture that we've had. The first one was white, made out of concrete or cement, and somebody very rudely beheaded the Good Samaritan. And so the original artist cast it again in bronze for us. And I'll talk to you a little bit about it. This is a, the one that's most well known, I would say, for, the, for Loma Linda University Health. And it is smack dab in the middle of campus because it's that important to us. Um, it reflects our value of compassion and the mission of service and healing that we have chosen for ourselves. You know the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and left him to die. Now, the artist has taken a little bit of artistic license. This uh, Good Samaritan looks like um, an African American. And we'll learn a little bit more about who the Samaritans were. Oh no, I'm sorry. But the most important part, this is so large that it won't email and I had a hard time saving it on a memory stick. Um, the good part is showing and that is this guy's face. Look at that face. What would you describe that look on his face? Smug. What, pride, what else? Smug. Smug, arrogant holier than thou. And this guy over here, did you notice he's wearing academic regalia? Yeah. I didn't notice that right away. And then I focused on the three uh, velvet stripes there on his sleeve. Uh, and he's got the TAM, so he's a PhD, or at least a, a doctor of some kind. And he's very carefully moving his robes to avoid the blood splatter. So one is a priest, and one is the, the Levite. I'm not sure which is supposed to be which. Maybe the smug guy is the priest? I'm, I'm not real sure. Um, but a Samaritan who traveled, passed, came where he was, took pity on him, bandaged his wounds, oil and wine. I would think the alcohol and the wine, depending on what proof it was, probably acted as an anesthetic, not an anesthetic, but a uh, cleaning, antiseptic. antiseptic, thank you, cleaning agent. And um, the oil probably kept all the creatures away, the flies, the gnats that maybe had been uh, drawn by the, the blood. Put him on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and paid. It isn't like he just said, 911. He had to do more than that. Um, and he said that I will return and reimburse you if you end up spaying, staying, uh, spending more. So which of these do you think uh, was the neighbor? And of course the, the lawyer said, well, the one who had mercy on him. Um, some people say that Samaritans were so despised that he didn't even want to say the Samaritan. He just said the one who showed mercy. And so Jesus' advice was go and do likewise. Samaritans were descendants of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. They intermarried with foreigners, 
and added some of those religious customs to their own religious customs. And if that wasn't bad enough, they provided safe haven. They were a safe city. Uh, and those outlaws of Judea could go there and live safely. So that, of course, made the two nations uh, get along even less. We also have this globe. Have you guys seen this globe? Maybe as you're walking from the church over here to Centennial. And on the globe down here at the base are names written that represent our faculty and our alumni who have served in the global mission. And when I first saw this, I thought it was so, I don't know the right word, incomplete. <laughs> I'm like, globe? What globe? And then I got to looking again, and, and I finally decided I really like it. Um, if you look, this is the view as you're coming to where we have Sabbath School. And it's really a nice reflecting pool there. Uh, you can see the globe as you look down into the water. And you will see names. Oh, man. I am so sorry these didn't come through. I wonder if I ran out of space. What that red arrow is pointing at is my name. <laughs> Laura Hastings Alapoon. And uh, I served uh, in all places in the Virgin Islands on the island of St. Thomas. I was supposed to go to Karachi, Pakistan, and they were having a civil war, and my parents decided that wasn't the best place for me. Um, I was also at one point uh, had signed up to go, oh, where was it, I forget which country, Ireland, I think, to be a preacher's assistant, but I was the wrong gender for that, so they turned me down. Um, this is my favorite story, Who Touched Me? And there was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much. If you can think about the era, they didn't really know what to do medically back then. And she spent all she had enduring <coughs> the treatment of the era, and it had actually grown worse. So she heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him and thought, I won't touch him. You think about it, she was unclean. She should not have been bumping into people in the crowd. She was to be isolated and alone because she was bleeding. She was unclean. So she didn't want to defile Jesus. She thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will get well. Alan, I'm so upset. These photos are not coming out at all. Anyway, the touch. You can see here, and then this is from the other side. So she was just touching him on his clothes, not to defile him, but to make sure that she was healed. Immediately upon touching his cloak, she was healed. Have any of you had a really low hemoglobin? Had a problem with bleeding? Trust me, uh, my hemoglobin runs 15. After the birth of my daughter, it was eight. And that was in, and trust me, that's huge difference. I mean, I'm already white, but I was really white. And I could walk maybe 100 yards, and I had to sit down. And they wanted, they toyed with giving me a transfusion, but that was in 1986, and the blood supply was not safe. My husband said, send her home with me, we will feed her iron-filled um, foods, and she will be fine. Do not give her a transfusion. Do not. I can tell you, if all of a sudden, by touching Christ's cloak, if I went from a hemoglobin of eight to a hemoglobin of 15, I would have felt it immediately. I would have felt that change. I would have felt that healing. Jesus perceived the power left him, and he turned around and said, who touched me? And the disciples, I would love to meet some of these disciples. They were kind of smart, Alex. You notice that? 
You see the people crowding against you, and yet you ask who touched me? Insinuating that Christ is maybe a little stupid, unless I'm reading that wrong. You will notice the artist, all the detail of the sandals, has put the footsteps, be a little crowded to sculpt all those people, but has put the footsteps to indicate that there were a lot of people. I am so upset that this PowerPoint is doing this to me. But he kept looking around to see who had done it, and this photo was a photo of her face. Matter of fact, there's the, the first photo, reflections, that I had to get rid of because it didn't work right. Um, so let me run through these. Alan, I'm sorry about the editing here. Uh, and this one was our, to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that shows, I think this is a piece of art as well, if you ever drive down this road that goes underneath. Um, let me catch up here a little bit. There's the smug guy, it's still not as good as I would like. There's my name. <coughs> okay, so this is definitely the better PowerPoint. Okay, well, not just because my name is just, <laughs> that's not what I meant. So, you know, this is the one where I think the photos are much better now. Um, and the artistry, this is so simple and elegant and yet so detailed. You can see the little wrinkles on his fingers. Uh, just such a good job. Who's the, who's the sculpture on this one? You know, I don't know the names, I'm so sorry. Um, well, this was Collins again. Yeah. Collins, Alan okay. Collins, yes. What was the first name? Alan. Okay. And where is this located? This is if you, on your way out. Is if you head north, it's it's there. It's in the north west corner of this complex area. Now I would encourage you to go out there. It's it's just so nice, and I mean you can walk up and touch these. Um, it's just amazing. Um, okay, let's go on to this next one. Um, I'm saying I'm too much. Okay. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. So there's a close-up of his depiction of Christ. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling in fear. Again, she is unclean. She is not to, to be out here. Uh, told him the whole truth. Facing humiliation confessed what had happened. You know, and this, this one, I love the way it is, and yet I have to admit it's hard to photograph because you, you can't get both of them from any one angle. Uh, that one there on the right is the closest I could get to get the faces of both of them. And the artistry of this he conveys so much, and yet in such a simple and profound way. So, bleeding 12 years, not bleeding out, but bleeding. This happens to women after childbirth sometimes, it just doesn't stop. Physically sick, exhausted, <coughs> socially unacceptable. Can you imagine how you would feel psychologically, to be told unclean, unclean, you have to be over here, out of the way, where no one is around you. She spent all her money. And the physicians, when I read some of the things that they would do to try to, you know, there was chanting, there was um, almost like an exorcism, exorcism um, pouring of, of wine and other noxious things all over her. Uh, none of it worked, uh, as of course we wouldn't expect it to. So these sculptures, and I love the rose garden that they have around it, the beautiful roses, uh, with complete with thorns, that are there. And this reflects Loma Linda's compassion and healing mission. Because look at all the healing that occurred, as I already mentioned. Physical healing, social healing, mental healing, psychological healing, spiritual healing. This woman had not been able to go to the synagogue for 12 years. So it's what we like to call whole person care on this campus. 
This is the new one. If you've not seen this, the DNA sculpture is on the south side of this building. So as you were walking uh, from the church, depending on how you came, you would see the globe first, and then you would see this DNA sculpture. It's so new that they haven't taken the ugly orange fencing down from it. This DNA sculpture was donated by an alum, and I don't know the name of this artist, but this was to depict um, science and faith. This is the science end of it, which is also um, at the center of what Loma Linda does. I was trying really hard to get some palm trees there through the, through the helix. Have you guys been out to see this one? This is the very place. This one is up by Nickel Hall. Uh, you have to go out to the cottages and as far east as you can go without falling down the hill. And it is exquisite. When they started this, the artist could not replicate a wagon, so they found an old wagon and uh, poured bronze on it. And when the representatives of Loma Linda first approached the White family, they said, no, you may not put up a statue or a sculpture of Ellen White. Their fear was that people would come and try to worship, and that was not something that um, they were open to occurring. So when people explained the vision of burden, Ellen, her son Willie, on the wagon as they came to Loma Linda, they said, yes, you may do that. The reason it's up at Nickel Hall is at some point they're wanting to put a museum up there and have the cottages be part of that, and that's why this is there. If you look closely, I mean, it's just exquisite, the detail. I, you know, look at um, Mrs. White's hands. I don't know that you can see from the back, but it's just exquisite. She recognized the sanitarium, and she said, I've been here. And her son said, mm, no, you've not. And she says, well, then I must remember it from a vision. And against the wishes of the brethren, a deposit of $1,000 was given to secure the property. I dare say that most of us could come up with, in this room, could come up with $1,000 today to do that. Um, but at that time, that was an enormous amount of money. They even have the step stool to get on and off the wagon. So there's a close-up of Willie White and John Burden. We still have uh, Burden Hall on campus to remember him. The beard, look at the beard. I, I'm just so impressed by these when I actually went out and was taking photos. The lace, the intricacy of the lace and the garment and the, the buttons, uh, the wrinkles in her brow, just uh, the artistry evokes that time period. Um, and I find that very special myself. No looking back. They secured the property, and they went forward, and uh, Loma Linda is still here, fulfilling the mission that um, was set before us. Laura? Yes. <clears throat> Today, when we're coming to church, we come from the villa down to uh, where the Grayson is, the dead end. And Jan said, I've never been up to see that sculpture. And we looked, and you can see the top. You can see the three figures. You can't see the buggy. But it's just interesting as you drive down from the villa to the racing center, looking up, you can see. That's cool. Yeah, there. that's cool. Well, make the trip up. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, we've been, I've been up. Um, very nice. And you can tell that this one, um, well, let me just tell you. Maybe you can't tell. This was shot uh, quite early in the morning, so we had some golden light coming from the east. This is in front of the medical center, Come Unto Me, and this was dedicated in 2009, and it's very apropos. 
and I am so glad that next to Christ they left a place to sit. We decided we needed to go early in the morning so no one would be sitting there. Um, I don't know how many of you, I wouldn't in, um, invite you to walk by the medical center now with all the construction, but um, if you happen to go by there, odds are someone will be sitting. Here's a close-up. We have a healthcare worker on the right, a little girl, a little boy, and three dogs. Not one, but three dogs. And Christ has his arm around the little boy, and of course the one of the dogs is snuggling there with him, licking his face, it appears. On the left here, we have... Um, either a physician or a respiratory therapist or someone who wears a long white coat, got a grandpa and his granddaughter. And again, the artistry is just incredible. You notice the little girl, her, she's up on one toe like she's about to take a step. And I love this because you can see, I had to be really careful to not get the reflection of me but I have the reflection of, of Christ in the window there, uh, in the photo. It's, um, it's just very touching uh, when you walk around these representations of our mission. I've never seen a picture of Christ smiling like that. Do we have any other artists showing him such a happy face? I don't know, uh, and yet, He's surrounded by the children he loves, so it makes sense to me that he would be smiling. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, that makes it even more special to you. Yes? Are you aware who is the artist here? I'm not. I'm so sorry I didn't his research that. Victor. Yes, sir. Do you know, right? Victor Isa is the name of the artist. Okay. This, this is a young Syrian man whose family are, are been the... the bulwark of the church in Syria, even though it has been blacklisted for many years. His father was a village evangelist that we knew well in the 70s. Both of his parents are buried him here. Victor's Middle Eastern name is Ghalib, which means Victor, uh, and so hence the English transliteration. He is a very simple young man who lives in Boulder, Colorado, and he has told us some of the uh, challenges. The, the sculpture of Mrs. White and her son and Dr. Burden. He said he was carrying these mock-ups to the foundry where they would be put into bronze and the head fell off of one of them. So I'm going to interrupt you. He did these sculptures and this is the very place up on the hill. Exactly. And the wagon, yeah. And okay. Yeah. He's a godly man. Just and an awesome artist. Let me just add a personal testimony for him, about him. Uh, he was a student at Middle East College, Middle East University now, when we were working in Lebanon, and I organized a singing group of young people, and uh, he, is, he is extremely talented. He, he, uh, we got a hold of a string bass, and we had a couple American students that played guitar. One of them taught him how to play the string, string bass, and so he played the string bass in our singing group. And we would uh, go up to the village where we were living, and uh, I would bring the singing group up there, and we'd have a Saturday night uh, open house in our little center there for the village young people. He has said in recent years, he said, you know, he said, <coughs> he, he has thanked, thanked me for and thanked us for having that singing group. He said, that was my salvation. He said, I began to see that we could have fun as young people and have contemporary music and still be good Adventists. Mm -hmm. good. And uh, so he, uh, in recent, more recent years, he, he actually is, if you have a, a CD of, of Ponder and Harp, uh, he plays a string bass on that CD. Interesting. So he's an, a musician as well as a, as a sculpture. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Here's a close-up of the little girl. Just incredible.
I couldn't resist taking uh, a photo of the mother dog and her puppy. And what was really interesting is that there are flowering uh, bushes there, you can see them, and on the photo on the right, one of the red flowers fell into to her flowers. <laughs> so I thought that was, that was fun. Just amazing. Now in this case, you will notice, he did put some ground under the dog's leg, because he didn't want that to, to break off or uh, have any damage. Now you notice this little boy though, that little boy is balanced up on the ball of one foot. That's the only thing that that statue or sculpture is supported on. Just amazing. And yet it's out there for people to walk up and touch and enjoy. Um, and here's the poor frazzled mom uh, carrying a leash trying to grab those dogs that have gotten away from her. Got a leg brace for the boy that's just come off his heel? I could, I don't know. I think so. I assumed it was, it or her purse. And now that I look closer, it almost looks like a purse. See it as a leg brace, but was that what it was meant to be? I had the idea it was something that, that he had thrown off because he had healed. Hmm. So this whole set of sculptures and the bench uh, is an invitation to healing, wholeness, and hope. Now, bear with me while I go back to the other PowerPoint. There are a couple of other slides that I added that may have come across one slide. Um, we'll see if I can get the computer to uh, slowly behave for me. Um, one of the members of our class um, sent me a message asking if I was going to talk about the crosses. Now when I was a child, we did not have crosses on our churches. It was considered inappropriate. And yet you'll notice this is a cross on our church right here uh, on the campus. Um, this I found online. This must have been the artist's rendering because it doesn't have the cross. But they're very upset by this saying that this is a phallic spire and the mitre of Dagon and that this is paganism. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you, this was not going to be the last thing, the, the, uh, this very place was going to be the last thing, but I don't know if any of you know why we didn't have crosses and why now some of the newer churches do have crosses. I personally, when I asked the question as a child, I don't know, 8 to 12, somewhere in that age, and my dad just said, well, some people think that's a little too much like the Catholic Church. So, okay, I get we're Protestants, but we, I mean, if it wasn't for Christ's death on said cross, where would we be? So, um, you look like you would like to say something. Oh, no, I'm just, I don't think it's any deeper than what you said. Okay. Um, we, we grew up in a time in the church where Whatever they did was wrong. So if we did the opposite, we'd be right. So if they had a lot of crosses, then we would have none. And so, you know, it's, it was an us and them statement, I think. And, uh, you know, all the way from crosses to spires to Christmas <coughs> trees to whatever, whatever you wanted to pick out. Um, if, if they did it, it was wrong. Uh, so we'll do the opposite. Um, so, you know, or it might just be architecture, you know. Right. Donna? Uh, I think where it goes back to, <clears throat> really to the Puritans, because it was not just Adventists, yeah. but it was no, no. all the early, yeah, yeah. the early Protestantism. I mean, remember that uh, they went through churches and tore out the stained glass windows, yeah. any image of any kind, including crosses. Yeah. 
And in, with Catholicism, you know, there's the crucifix, that is, it's a cross with the figure of Christ uh, on it, and that was considered a, an object of worship, and in a way it was, by, uh, because I can remember my great-grandmother, you know, dipping her finger in holy water and touching the foot of Jesus on her way in and out of, out of Mass, which she went to every morning at 6 o'clock. Uh, for many years. So I think it was an attempt to distance ourselves. And, and we were not alone. It was a, a Protestant, especially a Puritan thing. How is Mama Linda organized to decide what it will purchase and display and, uh, and what it won't? Who gets to, to decide this? There's a transaction here. There's a buyer and there's a seller and a producer here. So, so who is they? It decides what is purchased and what is displayed? Um, I don't know is the short answer. My guess is that it would involve a donor coming forward and saying, I, for example, the DNA sculpture. I wish to provide a DNA sculpture to show the other side of, you know, the faith and science. And then it would have to go through renderings to see if it was something that was acceptable to the university. So uh, my guess is that a donor would come forward <coughs> with an idea, and then I would guess Dr. Hart, the, the CEO, Dr. Carter, the provost, um, and perhaps others from the medical center would then, you know, the executive um, mahogany Rome folk would probably make that decision. Um, that that applies to the medical center more than the university. If you've been in McGann Hall, there's no mahogany and needs new carpet. So, what can I say? Sorry, just a, a quick a second question, big picture. Um, the Hebrew will not allow uh, any uh, picture of their God Yahweh or any picturization. In fact, the people are discouraged from even trying to imagine what good luck looks like. The Islam is the same because God in the end is incomprehensible and inscrutable and beyond the dimension of human thought. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we as Christians in Seventh-day Adventists, we will do art of Jesus, I'm thinking probably because he's relational. You know, we have a relationship with him and he was man God, but I've never seen Christian or Adventist art attempting to portray God the Father or the Holy Spirit or a picture of the Trinity, for example. It's right. just an observation. Yeah, I've not seen that either. I saw several hands over here. Yes, sir. I would be um, interested to know what member of the White family at first objected to that statue. Uh, all of the grandchildren of Ellen White are passed away now. Uh, I do know that in the uh, library or in the archives there, the research center, they have an old bust of Ellen White that Grace Jocks, one of the grandchildren, when she was still living, was so horrified by it that they have hidden it in the vault. And uh, they now have the new skull, uh, bust of Ellen White by Victor Issa. And by the way, the the... Ellen White on the on the carriage on the this is the place statue mm -hmm. and the one in the that is on display in the library um, are both based on an 1899 photograph of Ellen White in which she has that kind of lace uh, collar right. and so um, he's uh, at, and the White Estate has one of the in Silver Spring has one of those also but uh, it doesn't seem to me that any member of the White Estate Oh, the White family should, I mean, well, I guess it's a courtesy, but why should they be able to say, you can make this pick, this or not? I don't know. Uh, so I'd be interested to know who, 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 who said that. But um, at any rate, um, it would be interesting to know if there is any kind of an uh, artistic committee here at the university and the and the medical center that would decide on paintings, photographs, or anything else, you know. Um, before I go to anyone else, does anyone know the answer to that? A partial answer, at least. Yeah. <clears throat> All through the 1970s, when the medical center was still very new, uh, we had a president on campus, Dr. Bieber, 
and under his direction, there was a fine arts committee on campus. Mm. It was chaired by the Dean of Students, uh, Dr. Gaines Partridge. Uh, the only two members that I remember on that committee uh, were T.J. Woolley and Bernard Branstader. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, Which is why you remember, because you were part of it. Well, I can tell you that for at least some of these works that you've presented today, there were major discussions at the top level. The Good Samaritan was initially uh, refused at the top levels of the university because of its artistic license that you referred to. Uh, and it was only retrieved a year later by Board of the Trustees in response to, uh, to a pleading that I made to them at a meeting at La Sierra, when the whole board met together under the chairmanship that day of Neil Wilson. So you see there's a, there's a history behind all of these works and the history itself turns out to be rather dramatic in many ways. I had to debate with President Olson of that era, Vigo Olson, who was very conservative and nervous that anything that he would approve might be uh, severely criticized by his bosses, who were in fact on the Board of Trustees. So anyway. So thank you very much because the Good Samaritan is iconic in its representation of this university. Absolutely iconic. We have PowerPoints with it. I mean, it is, really represents the university. So Peter, and then we'll come back. Just to make a short. <laughs> and Donna, were you wanting to say on this? Yeah, I, I just, it's very interesting that you use the word iconic. Yeah. But in any case, uh, yes. but what I was going to say was, uh, on a much smaller scale, uh, I think I sent you an email, there are and now two pieces of art in within this building, Much, and one is my class of 1969 donated. It's a glass and metal, uh, and you see it on the, uh, on the landing on the stair that leads to the, uh, to the amphitheaters. But when we were trying to get that through, to get approval to install it, it was for our class. It was a big, a big uh, project. They kept saying, "Well, we don't have a committee. We don't have." So it went to this person and that person, and I don't know. And we should have a fine arts committee. We need a committee to approve this thing. <coughs> and I think they may, in fact, have one now. That was probably uh, murdered. There must have been a hiatus between the end of your committee and the beginning of whatever they have now. Because I think they do have one now. Okay, where is this located? It's in this building, and, and there are two pieces of art that are interesting in this building, both on the same level, down on us. Uh, one is the big wood. Well, the big wooden, that's right, that, right. Was, uh, that was donated by the auxiliary right. to the School of Medicine. And then on the opposite wall, if you look all the way to the landing of that staircase that leads okay. to the back entries of the amphitheater, you will see it's, we titled it To Make Man Whole, and it has three uh, radiating uh, ar metal arms and then a globe. Cha it's an interesting sculpture because it changes uh, with the light okay. during the day, and it has a now, I did not see that one, or I would have included it. I saw the wood, and I thought, well, it isn't a sculpture, and I didn't get the painting in the library. But there are other kinds of art. You're yeah. Yes, sculpture, yes. that's fine. But right. but if you go down on the second floor on your way out, you can see. Uh, good, I'll do that. <laughs> you I'll can do see that today. Today. Yes. I just want to make a short comment about um, uh, that image with the entrance of the University Church that uh, some consider for strange reasons that uh, it's a meter of Dagon. Uh, that, uh, to me, looks uh, exactly like uh, the entrance of a Gothic church. The Gothic churches were massive buildings throughout 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, and the main characteristic of this architecture was the pointed arch. And this is exactly that the way it looks. It's a pointed arch. It's, it's a feature of the Gothic art. 
Um, Alan and I were very fortunate uh, to go on a Viking River cruise to France. We came home December 24, saw a lot of Gothic churches. I have to admit, I get more distracted by those lovely gargoyles. I love gargoyles. Uh, but yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I have to say, there was one time we had been walking, I was out of breath. You know, my Fitbit tells me what my pulse is now. I sat down and it was a little high, understandably. And I focused on a stained glass window and took and was reflecting and took some slow, deep breaths. And after maybe a minute, I looked and my pulse was 69. 69. So there's something about having beauty to focus and reflect on, um, and whatever you want to call it, meditation, mindfulness, reflection, um, yeah, it's, it's good for us. And another characteristic was small, very small windows because the, the, the artists, the builders want to inspire awe oh, when we enter into the church. Right. A right. feeling of, of awe. Oh. Yes, sir. Um, it's within the last year or two, and I don't remember exactly when, that the cross was added to the university seal. Yes. And uh, that was quite a discussion by the board, actually, who made that decision. My understanding is that Dr. Hart did not <coughs> want the cross added. Correct, um, and I can tell you why. And some of us are sensed, uh, he and I think others of us that are concerned about that, are sensitive to the implications. We, we serve a lot of Islamic people. We have Muslims on our staff. Uh, and uh, some of us were concerned about that. But the board, and, and I think Dr. Hart actually did not want the, the cross added, but the board overrode him and uh, insisted that it be included. There was one individual who made an impassioned speech. And that's, this individual thought it had always been a cross. It had been a broken sword indicating peace. And that's what it was uh, as long as I was aware. And then when they made the change, we were in Saudi Arabia. And we said, um, we need our new cards that we've run out of in the old logo. We need our lab coats with the embroidery in the old logo. We need all of that in the old logo. Um, there's just no point in going forth with the cross on the seal that reminds them of 300 years of crusades and pig-eating Christians. There's just no point in doing that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the cross, but there's no point in uh, causing inflammation. So we were given absolutely you may use the old seal uh, for those purposes. I still have some of my old cards. I still have a lab coat that has the old uh, emblem. Yes? There was a time where I was very ashamed of the cross. We had moved into a very deeply, like 87, 90% Muslim country during the flood of the century. The country was inundated. People were suffering. Wherever there was high land for people to run, so did rodents and snakes and the whole bit. Our compound was a very closed compound. And our compound basically said, y'all stay out. We had lawns that were dry. It was not during school year. So we had a gym that was dry. Those rep, those people with no place to go from their flooded huddles were barred from our compound, from our dry lawns. And I was a very naive, I admittedly, newcomer. I said, why don't we open the gates? <coughs> And I was told, oh lady, you are a newcomer. We would never rehabilitate from what those people would do to our, our compound, meaning those horrible Muslims. But high above the walls stood the cross. And I felt passionately we must reveal the, the character of Jesus if we're going to use his symbol. So that was an example of the Good Samaritan not. Yeah. Here and then back. It's interesting what we, what we just discussed about the cross, how this, the symbol of the cross from early Adventism, which was anti-Catholic, to today, where it means anti-Muslim. Anti-everything. So, so uh, these symbols change as time goes on. 
What we need now is the Branson class to sponsor a sculpture celebrating women in ministry, mm -hmm. and underneath you put, to make humans whole. That would be the most controversial <laughs> one ever. <laughs> we over the years have debated changing that, because of course when it came into being back in the early 1900s, man meant mankind. Sure. Um, and so my thought always was start over. Just start over with a new model. Yes. Uh, in Mexico, every town have a cross to every town closest hill. I mean, little mountain. And here in my 35 years in America, I have seen recently growing crosses all over the United States. Um, and one time I approached a federal forest officer, and I said, this is not a uh, federal land? He said, yes. And I said, why did you put the cross there? Can I put the swastika up there and there's no problem? And he said, well, you need to go somewhere else to find out. To me, the cross is uh, the symbol of the false worship, false worship. Because if if I come to the church in Loma Linda and I take the cross and break it and in front of somebody else, I think somebody's feelings going to hurt. For what? It's just a piece of wood or metal. But the attachment to images, I think that's in my mind. I think that was the beginning of worshiping images because they attach to your uh, to yourself if you're worshiping i don't worship that cross <clears throat> there to me that is a signal this is a church a christian church uh, unfortunately for me um, the cross sometimes is representing intolerance as of late uh, intolerance to those who are born <coughs> differently from us whatever that may be um, if indeed we are worshiping that, then yes, that's a false uh, religion or a false worship. Yes. Um, I, I won't digress into it, but being on the church staff at the time when the church was remodeled, uh, the debates were vigorous uh, about what the architects were trying to do. And it didn't help that they were LDS architects and we some saw all sorts of conspiracies uh, getting into that. Um, uh, even down to the design of the chandelier and the foyer of the church got great debate about what that was and wasn't saying. So, but apart from that, um, I'm not an art person at all, but does it strike anybody that, with some exceptions, the art on this camp uh, campus is an attempted sort of... Um, Realism, if you like, they're almost photographs, you know, down to the detail. This is what Ellen White looked like. This is what we think. I mean, Jesus was doing. Whereas, you go to some other places, and art is very vague. It's very um, suggestive. It's it, it it sort of tackles the emotions. Where I think you can see emotions in our art if you work at it, uh, but I think it's more of an attempt. Maybe it's because, with, with you, I don't know why I spun around to see Paul at this time, but um, maybe it was physicians deciding on what <laughs> art we should have. Um, that everything was, everything was very practical and scientific and they were probably going to get a donation for it. Um, and that sort of took control. Um, I, I think we're a little impoverished, actually, in art on this campus. Uh, because it's, a, it's an attempt to be, well, yeah. here's what Ellen White looked like when she came to set up the place. And I think, okay, I can get a picture out of the White Estate to tell me that story. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, you're, I'm, you're hearing from a very <coughs> impoverished art critic. Okay, we'll go here and then we'll come back to this time. So since my name was mentioned, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> <from> speaking. <laughs> what, 
what is interesting to me is watching the discussion today, uh, I've seen a lot more emotion out of this crowd expressed than I've seen in a very long time. And I think this may hearken to your comment a little bit. The more realistic the art, the less vague the emotional content. And when we're looking at art here, which I agree is extremely realistic with regard to detail, and we're getting the kind of emotional response that we're seeing in the discussion today, it's possible that our particular uh, cultural heritage can't really handle vague art. I mean, if well, we're getting this kind of an emotional <laughs> response from that, imagine something that could be interpreted in ways. I, I wonder sometimes whether we're into image creation too much rather than letting something evoke the spirit. I mean, right. The emotion of the spirit. I've not heard from you, sir. <coughs> I think the pictures or the statues you've shown would be classified all as romantic art yeah. in, from that era. That's true. And, exactly. and it, it's really sort of the heritage of where our church comes from. But I was going to point out there are a couple of paintings that you, you might have included in your presentation today. They're in the Children's Hospital, mm -hmm. and they are really part of Adventist heritage. I think they're by Harry Anderson. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're, they're probably as good as Harry Anderson. Uh, might have painted things, and um, they're very romantic paintings also. Uh, um, I think they're in the lobby of the Children's Hospital, right, up behind some glass things, and so um, those two pictures would probably complete the, the, um, the art that, that's on this campus. Uh, Actually, there's, uh, what I chose to do was focus on the sculptures, because there's so much. I almost included the beautiful wooden one down, but if one of you doesn't want to do it, maybe someday I'll wander around the campus again and, and get all the paintings. There's a lot of them in the adult hospital as well. There's one in the library that's a little provocative, um, and I'm sure there are many. There's the, the obvious one or the quintessential one where Christ is there, outstretched hands over the surgeon in the operating room. There's a lot of paintings over there, so maybe we'll need to do one on, on paintings. I just wanted to say something on a more practical. So one day, my kids were acting up on Sabbath, and, and I'm like, we're going for a walk. And so we, we live very close to campus, so we walked here, and we went to each of these sculptures that you represented today, and then I told them the little story that goes with each of them. And it's just, I mean, maybe part of why it's so realistic is it really appeals and appeal to the kids, because they're very concrete. Sure. If you showed them, I mean, just not too long ago, we went to an art museum with my youngest son, and he's like, what, what did they do, have a paint fight? You know, I mean, it was, it, he couldn't understand that kind of art. Yeah. This is very concrete, and they loved it, so. Did you walk them up the hill, too? Oh, absolutely, I mean, we did the <laughs> walk. <laughs> they, they, they needed a lot of exercise that day. <laughs> I've often thought about the symbol of the cross and what it means to us, but if execution of that day would have been the hangman's noose or the guillotine, would there be the same emotion attached yes. as there is to the cross? I, I think so, because the cross at that time was as crude and vulgar yes. as the guillotine is to us. But today the hangman's noose is associated with so many different things. Yeah. I just wondered. Secondly, is in regard to the mission of the church, which is the second coming, the three angels' message used to be the focus of the Seventh-day Adventist church, it seemed, it's similar. And today, you know, there's nothing here that would depict our true mission, which it seems to me, which is the coming of Jesus. Maybe there is. The mission of the university and the medical center is a healing, teaching mission. And so the art focuses on that. Right. Um, the other things do come up, but we are focused on making sure that people can hear the gospel because they're mentally well and physically well and have full bellies and are able to have their needs met so that they can hear the message. So we're the message wearing work boots, I would say. I've not heard from you either. Uh, in the general conference, they have the second coming. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, all of the people around 
And I, I think that shows their mission, the, the second coming. Right. Okay, we have one minute left. I've not heard from you. Well, I was just reflecting on, on your comment about the literalism in the art and then your comment about being in the, the Gothic cathedral and then back to my my college years and art history and spending this summer in Florence. And, and through hundreds of years, all the religious art, it was, it was teaching for people who, who didn't have the literacy that we have. And there, there were all these multiple levels expressed there, the 12 apostles, the four gospels, and um, different Christian virtues. And, and, I, and I didn't see it as Catholicism, I saw it as teaching all these lessons that are so integral to the Bible stories that we learn when we're children as well. To a literate group, you're right. As you walk through the streets, whether it's Florence or um, in France, you will, or Salzburg for that matter, you will see the signs hanging outside show a mortar and pestle for a pharmacy or show a boot if it's where you can buy shoes because they were illiterate. And so I, I like that. I'm glad you brought that up. OK, um, I'll hang out if you guys want to chat. But I think for now, we need to go to our benediction. And don't forget, the next two weeks, bring a book and be willing to say a couple <coughs> sentences or a paragraph about why you liked. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I have no idea how you're going to edit that mess.